Hello and welcome back to Koala Moon, children's bedtime stories and meditations designed to make bedtime a dream. This is Marshmallow Clouds by Jane Thomas. Forrest lives behind the blue door at number 42. He's the one with the mass of red hair who walks around with a pair of binoculars slung around his neck. And he is constantly naming birds that are so distant in the sky, they're merely a hint of a black speck. A jackdaw, he'll call out, while everyone around nods their head in agreement and mumbles things like, Oh, yes, of course, a jackdaw. Quite obvious, really. Yes, that's Forrest. And Brooke lives behind the red door at number 44. She's the girl who always has a basketball with her, who can dash towards the hoop and in one, two, three easy bounces will always throw it through. Brooke never misses a shot. She's also the girl in a wheelchair, but nobody knows her as that. They know her as the girl with the basketball, and they know her as the one they want on their team. Brooke is the sort who's always picked first for a team, and Forrest is the sort who's always picked last. He's too likely to get distracted in the middle of a game and will pick up those ever-present binoculars, yes, even in the middle of a basketball game, to zoom in on a sparrow's nest or a passing parakeet. So the lives lived behind the blue door at number 42 and the red door at number 44 are very different indeed. But Brooke and Forrest are the very best of friends. And today, right now, Forrest is heading around to lift the great brass knocker that hangs on his best friend's red front door and invite her to head to the sweet shop with him. It's a cold sort of a day, one of those where it's a good idea to wear a hat and a scarf even if it isn't really winter yet, and the clouds are hanging low and heavy. Maybe they hold snow, or maybe just more rain. This is a particularly special visit to the sweet shop, as they've invited you to come along with them. They want to be sure you'll be cosy and warm. So imagine now that you're pushing on the coziest bright red hat with the most bobbling bobble that has ever been seen, and you're winding a long, pale blue scarf around your neck, once and twice and three times round. Take your coat from the peg in the hall, the one that has the deep pockets that you can bury your hands in, and slip your feet into those fur-lined winter boots that keep your toes extra warm and snuggly. Walk with Forrest up to the door and watch as he lifts that great brass knocker and lets it fall back with a dull thump that echoes throughout the house. If you listen carefully, you'll hear the rush of Brooke getting her things together. And here she is, opening the door and rolling her way down the ramp onto the path that winds its way through the garden and out to the little lane. She has that blanket in place that you all made together last year, the one with the squares of old clothes that you'd all grown out of and that you'd carefully, slowly, stitch together one by one, threading needles night after night, until, finally, the blanket was completed. The squares all tell stories that only you know. The moment when those clothes were worn and loved. What was your favourite jumper? Do you remember the last time you wore it? Imagine those moments, kept forever in a blanket of woven memories, wrapped around you and pouring those perfect minutes and hours and days into your dreams. The three of you are heading down the road now. Forrest keeps one hand loosely placed on the back of Brooke's wheelchair, not because it needs to be there, 
but because it makes them both more sure of each other. As long as his hand is in place, he isn't looking through the binoculars and getting distracted by specks in the sky. As long as his hand is in place, Forrest won't get left behind. You walk past fields that have long been cut short, the harvest taken in, and the fields left for now. Vast expanses of nothingness dotted with small patches of brown and green where the weeds are creeping in. In the far corner of the field are a group of rabbits, their white tails dancing bright against the darkness of the earth. The wind whips its way across the field, rustling the final few leaves that hang on the branches of the trees and throwing up the piles that lie in gold and red and orange heaps on the ground below. A single leaf is caught by the wind and floats past you, swirling and twirling and dancing and diving as the gust ebbs and flows. There's a small bridge to walk across now, an old stone one that arches in the middle as if stretching up, up and away from the coldness of the river that runs below. The water even looks cold today, grey and silver streaks spilling over rocks and pouring their way down towards the distant forest. In the summer, it's the perfect place to paddle, where you go and roll your jeans up and dabble your toes, and on the hottest days, dare to dive into the cooling depths. Not today, though, where it's a day to snuggle even deeper into your coat and bury your hands in your pockets and push your head as far as it will go into your cosy hat. You've reached the edge of the village now, and the first place you pass is the post office. The windows are steamed up, damp from the warm breaths being drawn inside. But it's just possible to make out the line of people waiting to send parcels and letters and packages to all corners of the world. There's something a little bit magical about post offices, and how they can take your words, your very own specially written, carefully crafted words, and whisk them away to the person you've chosen to receive them. Forrest has a pen pal who lives in Malaysia, and they often send letters back and forth, each choosing the brightest and most brilliant envelopes and insisting that the ladies in the respective post offices sell them the brightest and most brilliant stamps, too. Forrest's friend often sends stamps with pictures of birds so wild and wonderful that it's hard to believe they're even real, with impossible blues and turquoises and dashes of sunshine yellow and fiery red feathers dressing the birds in exquisite beauty. And now you walk past the bakery, where the windows are steamed up from the warmth of the bread and the cakes that steam gently on the glass shelves. The lady behind the counter dashes back and forth, spilling out smiles as she reaches for freshly baked loaves and delicate fairy cakes and muffins with tops that spill generously from the sides of the paper. Next, it's the hardware store, with almost half the shop seemingly outside on the pavement for all to see. The rakes and spades and gardening forks are leaned up against the wall, all shiny and clean, and waiting to be taken into gardens and fields and covered in glorious layers of mud and the wheelbarrows propped up and eager to be taken away and given a purpose in the world, helping haul hay to the horses and piles of fallen apples to be made into apple pies and crumbles and biscuits and bakes. And finally, here it is, the place 
you've all been waiting for. Brooke heads first into the sweet-scented Candyland, and you and Forrest follow close behind. It's one of those old-fashioned sweet shops, where everything is placed in huge jars on shelves that are so high they can only be reached by a ladder that rolls its way this and that as Miss Dewdrop guides it. She's a tiny old lady who looks out at the world over the top of her little round glasses and whose clothes fall in flowing waves around her. She wears her hair in a grey bun atop her head and fills it with pens and pencils and all sorts of useful things that she has a tendency to lose if she doesn't keep them close by. So she often has the appearance of having an eccentric sort of nest on top of her head. Choosing the perfect combination of candies always takes a while, for there are hundreds of thousands to choose from. And, indeed, there are quite literally hundreds and thousands in there too, should you wish to have a bag full of the tiniest coloured sugar balls that stick to the end of a licked finger and smile softly on your tongue. There's a chocolate fountain on the counter, and for a moment you imagine gliding away on a chocolate river, floating in a boat forged from the finest chocolate and that bobs across the little waves. The river swoops and swirls past a land made entirely of candy, with lollipops taking the place of flowers, and where sugar mice have come to life in a twinkling, twirling, whirling, pale pink mass beneath the shade of a gumdrop tree. Alongside the chocolate fountain, is a huge glass bowl overflowing with pink and white marshmallows. Imagine floating on a cloud of marshmallows, drifting through a pale blue sky on your billowing pillow of the fluffiest, softest bed, made from sugar and air, blended together in a magical way. Imagine feeling as if you weighed nothing at all and could float high above the world, with everything on it reduced to a size so small that nothing matters anymore. Imagine floating so high that you reach the stars and that you can drift between them one by one, lying there, on that softest of beds that bends and sways to your every whim. In the window of the shop is a huge white marble slab, and onto it Miss Dewdrop pours from a tilted jug, a river of unset fudge that rushes across the slab and waits for her to sweep it back and forth, smoothing it this way and that, expertly shaping and easing the waves of warm fudge so the coolness of the marble works its magic. This is something Brooke has watched for hour after hour, wondering at the way the shiny liquid fudge slowly cools and hardens before her eyes, before being whisked away as sticky squares in cardboard boxes, waiting to be taken to homes throughout the little village. You work your way along the top row of jars, looking at the fudges and toffees and jellies and candies, the chocolates and canes and sherbets and fizzers. Looking down to the next row, to see the glass jars filled with all the colours of the rainbow. Looking down to the row below that to imagine all the ways the sugar and sweetness can dance on your tongue. And there it is. The 
first, second, third, fourth, fifth from the left. The jar filled to the brim with your favorite sweets in the world. That's the one, you tell Miss Dewdrop, pointing carefully so she knows exactly where to wheel her ladder and exactly how many rungs she must climb before she reaches to the jar and turns to see you smile and nod and show that yes, this is the jar. These are the ones you will have today. And Miss Dewdrop smiles in turn and carefully takes the jar down, balancing it against one hip as she eases her way down the ladder one rung after the other, carrying it before her as if it is a trophy as she heads to the scales at the far end of the counter. She picks the right weight and places it on the flat disc, scooping your sweets into the brass bowl until the scales balance perfectly and your sweets seem to be floating in the air all by themselves. She takes the little brass bowl and pours your sweets into a paper bag, turning the top once and then again to make sure they are safely tucked inside. And because she is Miss Dewdrop, she takes an extra one of the sweets and hands it to you now, because she knows how very hard it is to walk all the way home and not help yourself to any of your favourite sweets. She replaces the lid and once more carries the jar before her, a precious prize that must be returned to its rightful place on the shelf, and once more balances it against her hip and slowly climbs the rungs of the ladder. Forrest has decided that today he will have the chocolate limes, and Miss Dewdrop repeats her performance, manoeuvring the ladder to the middle of the shelves and climbing up to reach the very top shelf and the first, second, third jar on the left. The chocolate limes, carefully weighed and measured, and the jar returned, she turns to Brooke, who has chosen the jelly beans today. Not the ones that are on their own. Not just the strawberry ones or the blueberry ones or the lemon ones or the bubblegum ones, but the jar that contains the hundred different flavours of jelly bean, all bundled together. So each taste is a brand new surprise. You all hand over your coins and pay for your sweets watching the money disappear into the cash register with a tinkle from the machine and a twinkle from Miss Dewdrop. She hands you each one of her favourites at the moment, for her favourite changes with her whims, and you open your hand to see the black and white stripes of a mint humbug, promises of a soft freshness filling your mouth as you head slowly home. It rained a little while you were inside the sweet shop, and now there are puddles lining the edge of the lane. Brooke's chance to rush through and splash you and Forrest with the spray from her gleaming wheels. You walk back, past the hardware store where the tools are now shining with the dampness from the rain, and a small puddle in the base of a silver bucket throws back the watery sunlight to the world. The evening is starting to draw in and the light is beginning to fade. It's time to head home, past the bakery with the steamed up windows, past the post office with its piles of packages waiting to be gathered up and whisked around the world, and towards the bridge where the river runs even more merrily than it did before now that more water is pouring into it from the hills and fields. 
passing by the field. The rabbits are long gone now, safe in their burrows and far from the dampness and greyness of the world above. The last few birds are heading home, disappearing into holes in trees and heading into soft nests to hide away until the morning. A few ducks are nestled in the marshy area over there, quacking a good night to each other as the sun sinks lower and lower and everything becomes nothing more than a silhouette against the skyline. You reach Brooks home first and both you and Forrest head up to the red door of number 44 with her. Then it is Forrest's home and you walk up together to the blue door of number 42, waving goodbye as you walk alone down the garden path and out onto the lane. It's just a few more steps now, only a few more steps and you can be in your own home and close your front door behind you. Now it's your turn to step into the warmth and pull the hat from your head and hang your coat from the peg in the hall and slip your feet from your fur-lined boots. Unwind the scarf once, twice, three times and slowly putting one foot carefully in front of the other you climb the stairs and walk towards your bedroom disappearing beneath the blanket and turning your head this way and that on the pillow until there he found it, the perfect spot. The wind whistles outside, but you are safe and warm in your bed. And the rain that drums softly against the roof can do you no harm. This is where you are supposed to be now, curled up with thoughts of marshmallow clouds drifting you slowly towards the stars and the moon. Imagine floating on candy floss, lighter than air. Your toes and feet and legs and body and arms, and hands, and neck, and head, feeling as if they weigh nothing at all. Close your eyes, and imagine where you would drift if you could drift anywhere in the world. All those beautiful places waiting for you with their streams and meadows, misty days and whimsical ways. Imagine a soft billowing warmth against your skin, drifting towards a land where pear drops hang heavy from the branches of trees and paths are paved with sugar where Miss Dewdrop comes by with her thousand glass jars filled with all the sweets in the world, with her clothes billowing softly around her in waves of smoothest silk, where you are everything you want to be and everything you will be floating through life on a candy floss cloud. We're drifting towards dreams now, the happiest, loveliest dreams you've ever dreamt. We're calm and cozy, your 
breathing is relaxed and you can feel that lovely weight of the blanket keeping you safe and warm. Aren't you comfy? You are so warm and cosy. So sleepy. As you drift into dreams, count all the things you're grateful for. Let yourself fill up with all of the little moments that made you smile today. See the faces of the people that made you laugh. Think of the things that challenged you. Think of the things you learned and the practice that meant you'll be a little bit better tomorrow than you were today. Think about how warm and cosy and sleepy you are here in your bed. What a day you had. Wonderful things lie ahead for you too. You will have wonderful adventures tomorrow and the next day and the one after that. The whole world is waiting for you. But there's no rush. There's nothing more to do today. All that's left for today is rest. Deep, cozy sleep. The most beautiful of dreams are waiting for you now. That's why you're drifting off gently into dreamland. So keep breathing slowly. Let yourself get toasty warm. Let your eyelids stay heavy. And know that you are safe. Remember that you are smart. You are brave. You are kind and you are loved. Think it to yourself. I am smart. I am brave. I am kind. I am loved. You are a dream. When tomorrow comes, you'll face it with a smile. Because you are smart, brave kind and loved because you are you uniquely wonderfully you what kind of dream are you drifting towards tonight you can dream however you want because your imagination is as wide as the universe what will you find in tonight's dream Maybe you'll see your favourite characters. Is that Hector and Sunny over there? Maybe you'll visit the moon, where there's mice eating cheese in the craters. Maybe you'll walk through Sleepy Forest, where Coco the koala is strumming his pink ukulele on the banks of Sleepy River. Let your imagination take you away. Your dreams are all yours. And you deserve the sweetest dreams of all. Because you are brave. You are kind. And you are loved. You are brave. You are kind. And you are loved. And you are wonderfully, uniquely you. You are a dream. And it's time to sleep, tucked up in your bed. Breathe slowly and melt into your bed. Isn't it warm and soft and cosy? It's time to rest. Take deep breaths in and out and let yourself relax as you say goodbye to the day. Let your body get even heavier. Let your whole body go floppy. 
drift deeper into sleep with every breath and say good night. Remember, tomorrow will be a good day because you have a big heart. You are a good friend. You believe in yourself. You know there's nothing better to be than yourself. It's okay to get things wrong. It's okay to ask for help. You can do whatever you set your mind to. Be proud to be different. Be proud of your achievement. Be proud of yourself. You are a good learner. You are a good listener. You are a good example to others. You are valued. You are loved. You are sleepy. So drift off now, little one. Let the dreams take over. As you sleep, let your dreams take you to magical lands and faraway places. Remember, there's no room for worries in your dreams. Just magic. It's a magic place where anything can happen. Anything you want. It's a place of positivity and light. Let positivity soak into you and fill you up. Imagine it as a golden light traveling from the tips of your toes to the top of your head. Imagine that wherever the light touches you fills with happiness. Imagine that the light makes you feel calm. You're wrapped in a warm, cozy glow within your soft, toasty blanket. Isn't that nice? You are safe, tucked up tight. So sleep soundly all through the night. Sweet dreams, little one.